All right, let's get started. Um, I'm Ring Jo. I'm delighted to introduce Professor Ahmad Zhang. Um, Professor Zhang is an assistant professor of sociology, biostatistics, and global affairs at Yale University. She received her PhD in public policy from Duke University in 2019. Professor Zhang's research interests lie at the intersection of health and aging family democracy and inequality. Her work has appeared in many high impact journals, such as the American Journal of Sociology, Demography, Social Science and Medicine, Inter International Journal of Epidemiology, and German Internal Medicine, among many others. Um, multiple of her projects have been funded by the National Institute of Health. We're delighted to have you. Um, and we're gonna save your questions for the end. Yes, thank you so much Yuin, for this very kind introduction for having me here. I'm so glad to be here today to share my latest work with all of you. And this is joint work with two of my amazing PhD students, Kitaro Okura and Yushi. And we are still working on this paper, so we really appreciate any feedback. Okay, so let me first start with some background. In the United States, anti-abortion laws have been increasingly successful at the state level, especially in conservative Republican-led states. While states have enacted 1,313 abortion restrictions since Roe v. Wade was decided in 1973, 566, almost half of them, since the beginning of 2011. Well, as we all know, like earlier this year, the Supreme Court even overturned the Roe v. Wade, um, ending the right to abortion upheld for decades. Although the Gallimarca Institute thought 2021 was the worst year for abortion rights in almost half a century, but I think we can all agree here it's only getting worse in some sense. So sex selective abortion bans are a special type of anti-abortion law that has been increasingly popular in the past decade. Sex selective abortion bans prohibit abortions on the basis of the sex of the status, in, uh, in particular girls. I mean, the popularity of such bans is really, really weird because the practice of sex selection is typically not regarded a problem in the United States. The advocates of sex selective abortion bans justify the passage of such bans by claiming that Asian, Asian immigrants in the United States disproportionately abort female babies because of a, a, cult, a cultural preference for sons. Well, as evidence, they extensively point to one study conducted by Columbia economists, which drew on data, data from the 2000 census and found a, uh, bias, a sexual racial bias occurring among immigrant Chinese, Indian, and Korean families if there was no previous sum. So to be more specific, they didn't find that a bias sex ratio for the first birth, but they found some was bias sex ratio for the second birth, but they found very bias sex ratio for the third birth. But notably, um, the sample size they have for third births among these immigrant Chinese, Indian, and Korean families is like 324. And later studies analyzing more recent data have pointed out that the findings from this study are kind of misleading because if they look at all births, regardless of parity, actually there's no male bias sex ratio among immigrant Chinese, Indian, and Korean families. In fact, among these families, the proportion of girls is even higher compared to uh, white American families. Legal scholars have also argued that sex, a sex racial bias is not necessarily proof of sex selection practices. And there are actually easier and safer ways if you really want to select the sex of the baby than performing sex selective abortion. So uh, in addition, there has been some evidence showing that actually uh, some preference is not culturally unique to Asian immigrants. Um, in fact, uh, I mean, based on the Gallup poll conducted in 2011, when participants were asked if you can only have one child, American men preferred a boy over a girl by a margin of 49 to 22%, where there's no gender preference among American women. So as we can see um, that, um, well, the, um, the, the claim criticizing Asian culture for male bias sex ratio or male bias it, it, it blends the reality that some preference is not an euro phenomenon in all patriarchal societies, including the United States. At a minimum, it's, it, it's an overreach to say that um, it's very common among Asian immigrant families in the United States 
to abort female babies, and uh, sex selective abortion is a sensible or effective policy solution. So legal scholars have concluded that sex selective abortion bans in the United States is a solution in search for a problem. Okay, so this map shows the prevalence of sex selective abortion bans across the country. These kind of bans were initially passed in Illinois and Pennsylvania in the 1980s, but no, but no states followed their path in the next in the next decade. And suddenly, starting in 2009, uh, there has been a research uh, in 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 the, in the interest of passing such bans. So 12 states enacted sex selective abortion bans between 2010 to 2020, um, and and we can see the dark blue states on the map. There are those states who have successfully enacted the bans. Many other states attempted or are currently trying to do the same. The medium blue states are those states who have successfully proposed a ban but didn't enact it. The light blue states are those states who have not proposed a ban yet. Okay, so we may, we may want to ask, why is this resurgence now? So in, in part, it, that, this trend reflects the broader expansion of the anti-abortion laws throughout the country. But the pursuit of the sex selective abortion bans itself uh, is also a uh, nativist response to the dramatically changing demographics, especially in conservative southern and midwestern states. These states, such as uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Oklahoma, and North Carolina, they have seen the fastest growth in Asian and Hispanic immigrant population during the past decades. And if we look at the absolute number of Asian immigrants, of course, I mean, the largest number is still in California and in New York. But if we look at the growth rate, it actually happens in this non-traditional immigrant states. And uh, we also know that previous studies have shown that relatively increases matter in terms of perceptions for threat among the, among the natives. So the advocates of sex selective abortion bans tap into the growing anxiety about the recent influx of these foreign outsiders uh, into the state, and they try to frame the concern into sex discrimination. So for example, uh, South Dakota State Representative Don Hager says the following in public. So let me tell you, our population in South Dakota is a lot more diverse than it ever was. There are cultures that look at sex selection abortion as being culturally okay. And I will suggest to you that we are we're embracing individuals from some of those cultures in this country or in this state. And I think that's a good thing that we invite them to come, but I think it's also important that we send a message that this is a state that values life regardless of its sex. Another South Dakota state representative, uh, Stacey Nielsen, said, many of you know, I spent 18 years in Asia, and sadly, I can tell you that the rest of the world does not value the lives of women as much as they value the lives of my daughters. As you can see that these advocates, they use Asian immigrants as a convenient foil to promote their anti-abortion agenda. And they're kind of smart in a way because they try to turn the table around, they try to turn the table of pro-choice criticism, which is the denial of women's rights into pro-life advocates. So there have been a lot of discussions about this ban uh, among legal scholars, but so far there has been only one empirical study that looked at the consequences of this ban. So uh, Nandi et al. 20, in 2014 looked at the effect of such bans uh, which were passed in Philadelphia and Illinois in the 1980s, um, Asian infant sex ratios. And they, they did not find such bans had any effect on Asian infant sex ratios. But how about potential health consequences? For decades, sociologists have argued that um, population health is not only determined by medical care, but also is significantly shaped by various social factors. Social policies are considered one important social determinant of health. So for example, previous studies have examined uh, the effect of the Arizona SB 1070 immigration bill and found that this kind of immigration bill uh, negatively affected the uh, Hispanic immigrants' birth outcomes by increasing maternal stress. So we have a very interesting case here because 
Sex selective abortion bans, they're they are not a type of immigration policy. They are a type of anti-abortion law, which was justified by singling out a growing, in, growing immigrant population. Um, so we, um, and I think this is one important reason, reason why the population health consequences, especially among Asian immigrants, have been overlooked, uh, 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 I mean, so far, because people just didn't realize the link. We invoke the structural stigma framework to think about how sex selective abortion bans may have affected Asian immigrants' uh, birth outcomes. According to structural stigma theory, uh, societal level cultural norms and beliefs, including widespread stereotypes, can, afford, uh, can affect the well being of stigmatized populations. And here we want to uh, emphasize that this concept is very different from closely related concepts such as structural racism or structural discrimination, because uh, structural racism is a much broader concept. And most of the previous studies which use the structural racism framework has emphasized the importance of the uh, channel of material resource separation. So here we don't think uh, material resource separation is a major channel here in our case, instead social climate is. We think so because one of the most important reasons is that Asian immigrants in the United States, on average, actually they have relatively higher social economic status compared to uh, white Americans. So we argue that sex selective abortion bans negatively affected birth outcomes of Asian immigrant mothers by increasing the salience of harmful racial stereotypes mm -hmm. and reinforcing a hostile social climate that is unwelcoming of Asian immigrants. We have two hypotheses. First, we hypothesize that the structural stigma that sex selective abortion bans in gender had a negative effect on the birth outcomes, for instance, of Asian immigrant mothers measured by low birth weight and preterm birth. Second, we hypothesize that the passage of the sex selective abortion bans had a little or no effect on the sex ratio infants born to immigrant, Asian immigrant mothers. We had the second hypothesis because first, we don't have good evidence to show Asian immigrants actually practice sex selection. And even if they do so, there were other safer and easier ways to select the sex of the baby. So we just don't think this kind of ban would be effective in affecting uh, the infant sex. So we use data from the 2005 to 2019 nat natality birth data from the National Vital Statistics System. The data has information on all registered US births. And we keep this time frame, frame because 2019 is the latest data we can get. And we choose 2005 because it's up to five years before the passage of the first sex selective abortion bans invoking stereotypes against Asian immigrants. We also can restrict data about immigrant mothers, countries of origin, and the states of residence. We restricted the, the data to single term births given by foreign born mothers. We excluded missing cases in all counts, which only account for like less than 1%, and treated the missing observations in covariates as a separate, separate category uh, to avoid like sample selection. Our final sample has more than 12 million births for all, uh, all the three outcomes. Our uh, main, main outcome variables include low birth weight, which is measured by birth weight uh, lower than 2,500 grams, and preterm birth, which is measured by gestational age lower, uh, smaller than 30, 37 weeks of pregnancy, and infant sex, which is measured by the probability of having a male infant. We, we consider the following individual covariates, uh, including birth month, paternal race ethnicity, infant sex for the two outcomes, low birth weight and preterm birth, maternal educational attainments, paternal educational attainments, mother's age, father's age, mother's marital status, live birth order, and number of prenatal visits. So we employed a, a triple difference strategy. Specifically, we consider three differences. The first difference is between the treatment group and the control group. So our treatment group is defined as those states which have successfully enacted the sex selective abortion bans. Our control group are those states that did not. And uh, so therefore, that we didn't include Illinois and Pennsylvania because these bans, they were, they enacted the laws in the 1980s and they did not invoke uh, xenophobic, xenophobic 
stereotypes about Asian immigrants. We also did, did not include Tennessee and Mississippi because they passed the ban in 2020, and we don't have data for that. We also excluded Indiana, Kentucky, and Arkansas because the three of them passed the ban, but blocked the ban shortly after it was passed. So essentially, it was not effective. The second type of difference we consider is between before the ban was passed in the state and after the ban was passed in the state. The third difference we're, we're, we're considering is between the Asian immigrants, which are, which are the target, and all the other immigrants. Um, so the triple difference estimator has much weaker assumption compared to a classic difference in differences estimator, because it's essentially the, the difference between two DID estimators. So the two DID estimators, the first one is the DID estimator among Asian immigrants across states and across years. The second DID estimator is uh, the DID estimator for all the other immigrants across states and across years. And then the triple difference estimator is just a difference of these two DID estimators. So in other words, even if both DID estimators were biased, uh, as long as they were biased in the same way, the, our triple difference estimator is still unbiased. So here's our model specification. So why IST is the worst outcome of individual I in state S and year T. And SSABIST is the time varying dummy and it captures if a, a sex selective abortion ban was enacted in state S and year T. Asian I is, a, is an indicator for Asian immigrants versus all other immigrants. And we also included a state and year fixed defects. And importantly, in this model specification, which is a monster, we included the three, three sets of interaction terms. First, we included interaction terms between the year dummy and the state dummy, which can remove differential time trends of the outcome for different states, such as the effect caused by differential proportions of Asian immigrants across different states in each year, and the effect caused by annual unemployment rates across states. Just two examples here. And then we also include the interaction terms between the Asian dummy and the state dummies. These interactions allow the effects of being an Asian immigrant to vary across different states, accounting for effects due to selective migration to each state among Asian immigrants. For example, people may worry that uh, Asian immigrants who live in these conservative states, they are probably more conservative. So these interaction terms will be able to take care of that. Finally, we also include the interaction terms between Asian and the year dummy. And these interaction terms allow the effects of being an Asian immigrant to vary over time accounting for effects due to an increasing or decreasing trend of anti-Asian sentiment in all states over time. We also additionally examine the net dynamic effects of the bands. So here we basically replace the SSAB dummy with a uh, SSABD dummy, which is a categorical variable with the following categories, not enacted, zero to two years after enacted, and more than two years after enacted. We have actually experimented every year since the ban was passed and, uh, and decided that two years is a substantively meaningful cutoff. Okay, so now let's look at some results. So let me first show you some descriptive patterns. I found these descriptive patterns are already very, very striking. So the figure shows the prevalence of a low birth weight over time by immigrant group. And we, the two lines, one is for the treatment state, and one is for the, the control state. As we can see, uh, for Hispanic, white, and black immigrants, the, the two lines uh, between the treatment and control states, they are either indistinguishable or relatively parallel over time. But if you look at the Asian immigrants, we see the gap actually incre uh, is increasing over time, especially um, it started increasing around the year 2013, which coincided with timing that the sex selective abortion bans were passed in many of these states. If we look at the prevalence of low birth weight over time by non-immigrant groups, we don't see anything. And if we look at the patterns for preterm birth, we see consistent findings. Again, here only among Asian immigrants, we see an increasing gap over time. And the, the start of increase is around 2013, which coincides with the timing of the uh, sex selective abortion bans. And similarly, we don't see anything among non-immigrant groups. Now let's look at the results from the triple difference estimate, uh, estimate uh, uh, regressions. So panel A shows the, the main results. 
as we can see, the sex selective abortion bans significantly increase the probability of a low birth weight and preterm birth by, uh, by around 0.3% to uh, by about 0.3 to 0.5 percentage point, respectively. And we did not find a significant effect on infant sex. Just as robustness checks, so we also changed the reference level from all other immigrants to white immigrants and white Americans. If the results are consistent, that just gives us uh, more confidence that the assumption of the triple difference is not violated. So in general, we find the results for in panels B and C are consistent with the results in panel A. So that's one exception when we compare to white immigrant mothers, the coefficient on low birth weight uh, at the top is not significant at the 10% level, but the direction of the coefficient is still positive and actually the p-value is just about 0.1. And another exception is when we compare to white American mothers, the coefficient on male infant sex uh, is actually now significantly negative. But the, I mean, overall, we have pretty good evidence that sex selective abortion bans across mothers with patients um, have negative effects on Asian mothers' uh, birth outcomes. But I don't think we have a strong evidence to show that the ban actually affects infant sex. Well, these results are consistent with uh, both of our hypotheses. We also uh, examine the dynamic effects, and we can see that we don't see any significant effects uh, within the two years right after the ban was, was, in, the ban was enacted. And however, the effects started to show up for low birth weight and preterm birth after two years which is actually highly consistent with a lot of previous studies examining policy effects, because uh, typically people need time to respond to the policy. So it typically takes time uh, for the policy effects to show up. Okay, um, so although we cannot directly test our, uh, our hypothesis mechanism, which is uh, the, sex, the, the effects of sex selective abortion bans is largely driven by the worsening social climate uh, among Asian uh, towards Asian immigrants. But we did a number of exploratory analysis to provide some indirect evidence for the hypothesis mechanism. So here, although we don't have direct measures about social climate towards Asian immigrants per se, but we do have some measure about social climate towards immigrants in general. So the Immigrant Policy Index was an index constructed for, by a group of scholars uh, at the Columbia Public Health, Public Health School with a more negative value indicating a more exclusive social climate towards immigrants. And if we plot the, the index over time and by our treatment group and control group, and we can see actually the gap is also uh, becoming larger over time and specifically um, for, for our treatment group, which are the states who pass the ban, they increasingly have a more exclusive social climate towards immigrants. And then we also conduct formal statistic analysis and confirm the finding that sex, sex selective abortion bans significantly predict uh, a more exclusive social climate among, uh, towards immigrants. Okay, so we also emphasize that the major mechanism is about social climate rather than um, material resource separation. But some of you may argue that, well, actually it's possible um, that the sex selective abortion bans as one type of anti-abortion law could have restricted access to abortion services or more generally prenatal services among Asian immigrants, which lead to worse birth outcomes. Well, in order to test this, uh, alternative mechanism, we look at the three outcome variables. First is the inadequate utilization of prenatal care services, which is measured by the number of prenatal visits, smaller or equal than five times. And the second variable is whether study prenatal care in the first two trimesters. And then the third variable is whether a mother used any prenatal care at all. And we examine the effects of sex selective abortion bans on the three outcomes. And our results do not support this alternative hypothesis. In fact, we find that uh, um, sex selective abortion bans actually increased the prenatal care utilization among Asian immigrant mothers. Why so? So it is possible that this kind of ban increased maternal stress among Asian immigrant mothers, and the increased stress actually lead to more use of prenatal care services. 
Well, another alternative uh, mechanism also, uh, which is related to material resource separation is differential physician behavior towards Asian immigrants. So sex selective abortion bans may increase physicians likelihood of engaging in profiling and interrogating Asian immigrants about their reasons for seeking an abortion. So this may negatively affect Asian immigrant mothers birth outcomes in two ways. So first, it may increase stress uh, among Asian immigrant women. And second, it may actually lead Asian immigrant mothers to be less likely to seek abortions and instead decide to carry out unwanted pregnancies. So in order to test this mechanism, we exploited a uh, heterogeneity in physician requirement among the states who passed the sex selective abortion bans. So basically some states, they have more strict uh, requirement among physicians. They actually have legal requirements for the physicians to ask certain kind of questions when they say uh, like, uh, when they suspect a woman is getting abortion because of sex of the child. And if the physician doesn't do so, uh, he may end up in jail or lose his license. Well, in other states, it, it's, it's not that strict. So in theory, if this uh, mechanism is true, we would have expected to see stronger effects of, among um, states with stricter restrictions uh, for physicians. Um, but our results do not support this possibility either. Okay, so now let me show you some heterogeneous effects, uh, first by educational attainment. Uh, as we can see on this figure, uh, the effects of sex selective abortion bans is especially strong among Asian, Asian immigrant mothers with at least college degrees. Actually, if we test the coefficients across groups, with the difference is significant at the 5% level. So this result is interesting. It further confirms our hypothesis, uh, our hypothesis that it's not about uh, material resource separation, because if that's the case, we would expect to see stronger effects among less educated mothers. But here instead, we see stronger effects among more educated mothers, indicating that it's possible that more educated mothers they are more attuned to the changes in social climates towards immigrants. We also look at the heterogeneous effects by infant sex, but we didn't find any significant differences. And finally, we look at the heterogeneous effects by country of origin to uh, test the hypothesis that uh, Asian immigrant mothers from China, India, South Korea, and North Korea, they might be more affected by the bans because their home countries have been stereotypically uh, linked to, to the sun preference. And our results show that's in, indeed the case. We see these mothers uh, from China, India, uh, India, South Korea, and North Korea, they are more affected and the difference across uh, groups uh, is significant at the 5% level. We also conducted various robustness checks. Um, we can come back to this if people have questions, but here I want to highlight one important finding, which is we also examined the effects of the ban in all the other immigrant and non-immigrant groups, but we didn't find anything. So in other words, it's not about Asians as a whole because we didn't find effects among Asian Americans. It's also not about immigrants as a whole because we didn't find effects among any other immigrant groups. So it's really about the intersectionality between being an Asian and being an immigrant. To conclude, the main message from this study first is the rapid increase in Asian immigrants has been accompanied by the rise in anti-Asian and anti-immigrant sentiments. Conservatives have taken advantage of this backlash to exploit Asian immigrants as a convenient foil to advance an anti-abortion agenda. Sex selective abortion bans are justified by playing on harmful racial stereotypes about Asian immigrants and their cultural preference for sons. And in this study, we empirically showed that um, sex selective abortion bans had a negative effect on the infant birth outcomes of Asian immigrants, and specifically uh, it increased the probability of low birth weight and preterm birth, but we didn't have consistent results on whether it affected uh, infant sex. And we found this harmful effect is particularly large uh, among more educated mothers and mothers from China, India, South Korea, and North Korea. This study has a couple of limitations. Uh, first of all, um, although we employed a very strong empirical design, but it's not randomized control trials, and it's actually impossible to do that kind of experiment for policy evaluations in most cases. So in theory, it is still possible that all of those factors may still confound our results. 
And second, because of data limitations, we cannot directly test mechanisms we, pr we propose. And third, uh, some states in our sample enacted sex selective abortion bans in 2020, so we don't have data yet to, to include those states. So our findings have important theoretical and policy implications. To begin with, uh, theoretically, uh, our findings show how state laws, such as sex selective abortion bans, that symbolically target and stigmatize marginalized groups generate harmful consequences for population health. And then we show it from a, for a very understudied population. So uh, my students, I actually searched all these articles published in ASRNGS in the past 20 years. Not a single article talked about Asian immigrant and population health. And we show that for this specific population, it's actually now the material resource deprivation that drives the just the consequence. It's actually the social climate. This is in contrast to the focus in most previous studies that are focusing on the material resource deprivation as a major mechanism through which social policies may affect population health. Second, uh, our findings have um, implications on policymakers who are interested in the processes of immigrant incorporation. So a classic series of simulation argue that decreasing socioeconomic status boundaries between natives and immigrants would inevitably lead to a sense of shared peoplehood. Well, our findings show it's not the case. The pathway for Asian immigrants to achieve genuine symbolic belonging in American society is hampered by sentiments of xenophobia and nativism. And our investigation of the sex selective abortion bans is of timely public policy interest given the rapid expansion of abortion restrictions in the United States and the Supreme Court decision in the summer of 2022 over 10 year Wade. And finally, uh, our investigation of the sex selective abortion bans also comes at the time when the anti-Asian hate crimes have spiked, uh, rising uh, by almost more than 300 percent from 2020 to 2021, mainly because uh, of the rising anti-Asian, anti-immigrant sentiments during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this kind of rising anti-Asian, anti-immigrant sentiments will uh, most likely lead to worse population health consequences among these groups. And we need more study on, on that. That's it. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Emma. This was really fascinating. Um, my question is, um, I guess I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you're thinking about the effect of the bans. Um, because, you know, when you were showing those quotes from those lawmakers in North Dakota, was it? Mm -hmm. I was thinking about how, like, one could interpret these results as being sort of an indication of broader anti-Asian sentiment among the people in those states and kind of power for those voices in politics. Um, and then when you showed that the kind of the index of like anti-immigrant sentiments, then I was thinking maybe there are like it's we can see these SSABs as like kind of indicative of broader policy, or do you or do you interpret it as specific to the birth, um, like as specific to the, the uh, anti-Asian sex selective abortion bans specifically? Um, yeah, thank you so much, Maggie. It's such a good question <laughs> because we have been thinking about it for a long time. So I think for most like reproductive health scholars, they, they, they may tend to think that uh, the effects are largely driven by the broader anti-Asian or anti-immigrant trend in those conservative states. So we, we totally agree. Actually, I think that's the case. But still, after we take those effects away, we still see the effect of the policy per se. So uh, I think the results really point us to the story that this kind of anti-Asian, anti-immigrant sentiments already existing in those conservative states before the ban was enacted kind of lead to the passage of the ban. And then the passage of the ban kind of reinforcing or like further causing more anti-Asian, anti-immigrant sentiments in these conservative states. So I think like uh, the, the passage of the ban is not only a consequence of this already rising sentiments, but also it's a cause uh, of this like uh, worse population birth outcomes. So more specifically, um, in order to take care of the uh, broader 
like anti-Asian immigrant sentiments in those conservative states, we have the interaction between being an Asian and being the, uh, uh, the interaction between Asian and the state dummy, which could uh, take care of the differential like sentiments towards Asian immigrants in different states. And also when we look at the effects of that among other immigrant and non-immigrant groups, we didn't find any harmful effects among Asian Americans or any other immigrant groups. So I think that gives us more confidence that uh, the ban itself has some effects. Although I, I, I would like to admit that the magnitude of the effect is not particularly large, but actually uh, it's not small in a way because most policies, they don't have huge magnitude in, in like population health all comes, particularly like birth weight and the uh, preterm birth. Just one quick follow up. I, I guess like if there were, if the passage of the ban itself were, were indicative of some kind of like broader voice of these mm -hmm. sentiments, but it seems like just the um, interaction dummies like wouldn't necessarily pick up on time varying effects of anti-Asian, broader anti-Asian sentiments. So not necessarily like not an effect of the ban, but mm -hmm. again, the ban could be acting as like sort of giving voice to um, broader sentiments. Right, right. So um, I, I think we partially take care of that by including the interaction between year and, and the state and year and Asian. So yeah. the year of Asian kind of take away the effects of the broader anti-Asian sentiments across all states over time. And the state and year, they could uh, um, kind of take care of part of the, you know, differential effects on birth outcomes for, I mean, different states in different years. Um, yeah, so I think technically we could add like three-way interactions, but then uh, I'm not sure where the model will fit. But uh, yeah, in any case, I think it's uh, it's still possible. But I think uh, we did so many robust checks, so we have pretty good confidence that the band itself has at least something, uh, maybe not big. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, me. Thank you so much. This is super interesting. Um, my question is, um, I was trying to think, following up on that here. What exactly does SSABs capture, right? So if SSABs, as you said, both invoke and is emblematic of the anti-Asian stigma um, and sentiments, I'm curious to hear uh, more about why you think that you don't have necessarily have an effect, a uh, final effect for the infant health outcomes for Asian Americans. Because presumably this group are also similarly subject to the stigma of you know perpetual foreigners or you know um, sort of those those kind of racialized stigma. So why do you see that um, we don't have an impact on that group? Yeah, that's a very good question again. So so I, I think um, that really points to the importance of the intersectionality between race, ethnicity, and nativity. Uh, which has uh, been documented a lot in population health. And um, I think we don't see the effects among Asian Americans. Uh, um, I, I, I mean, if we think about this intuitively, right? So if the mechanism is more about social climate, so the Asian Americans may not necessarily notice this, uh, this ban towards the Asian immigrants. And they may also not like thinking about the same thing as those Asian immigrants. Um, so, so just, yeah, so, so I think like our findings that we didn't find anything among Asian immigrants, uh, I think really point to the importance of the intersectionality. Um, and also point to, I mean, related to your first point uh, about, um, well, this ban was kind of both a consequence and a cause of, of the sentiments. And uh, I think it's similar to, to a lot of the uh, studies on like slavery and uh, incarceration. So uh, incarceration is both like kind of a consequence of the slavery legacy, but also itself kind of a cause for the harm uh, on a lot of the outcomes. So I think it's a similar uh, narrative here. Uh, I don't know people. So, um, so you do you want to call for yeah. me? <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for giving your talk. Um, so I think in the, in the beginning, um, you alluded to this fact that uh, Asian immigrants move into an area that, that stirs up existing anti-Asian sentiment, um, and that might you know, make it more likely to, to, to pass one of these bans. Mm -hmm. um, my first question is, could you test this more rigorously? You know, maybe you just find a correlation. That would be helpful. Um, my second question is, if it's people moving into an area, Asian Americans, that seems to um, affect the trend 
of the, the selection of Asian Americans in that, in that given area. And that might just give you a different trend, you know, in your difference in difference estimates. Are you worried about sort of this, these populations moving around in your sample? Um, that's a great question. So the first question is about selection. So, um, so if I understand correctly, it's more conservative Asian immigrants are more likely to move to a state, and then, and also there there will be rise in the anti-Asian immigrant sentiment, right? Um, so also I I think I back to Yun's question. So I think the narrative also has a very explicit uh, immigrant narrative. So there was talking about this foreign others. So Asian Americans may, may not necessarily fit into that. So, so back to your question. So uh, whether we can directly test there's a rise in uh, anti-Asian sentiment. So we haven't done so, uh, although there have been lots of qualitative studies showing that, uh, including some previous work by the legal scholars. So they, uh, they, they have some data in their paper, but I, I agree with you that we, we could discuss more in our paper as well. Um, the second thing you're saying that if a lot of Asian immigrants move to the States, that may change the population composition of the state. So in which direction do you think that would uh, change it? I'm not sure, but like, I, I feel like there's a trend somewhere. I'm not sure if it's mm -hmm. all up or down. I feel like there's a trend there that we haven't accounted for in this paper. Yeah, so, so I think, uh, yeah, we could potentially look at the uh, racial composition in those states over time and see whether, whether there's a change and poten potentially test like, you know, whether um, in those states where they have the influx of the Asian immigrants, whether they have significant changes in, in the demographic uh, composition. Um, right, so, um, but, but, the, but for our model specification though, so every birth, um, so we know the residence of the mother. So if they move, then they, we would attract their residence as well. So, so I think that residence should be accurate. We also have the, Birth, I mean, the birth state of the, the outcome. And um, I mean, the, the birth state and the state of residence actually are highly, highly similar. So I think 98% of them are, are the same. Um, so, so I think that, yeah, I, I don't think how it would affect our results, but I think that's an interesting point. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks for the talk. So I think maybe one way to think about the selection thing is if maybe workers, only a few workers are moving into a town for maybe, um, I know like North Dakota, South Dakota is like big oil work and they're mm -hmm. like maybe more hardy or something like that. And then as the community grows up, you get more workers who are immigrating and maybe they'd be more predisposed to having low birth weight, not necessarily saying that's what's going on, but that's mm -hmm. a possibility. Um, so I guess my question, I maybe I'm curious to expand a little bit on, I think the mechanism you're proposing is very much about this um, racial stigma that these laws are driving around. Um, but I, I guess in my mind, I would think that the laws are driving up stigma when like you have the quotes, when the laws are being discussed and not so much after they've been implemented. Mm -hmm. And so am, am I correct that your results are like not, you don't really find that it's a differential treatment maybe by the doctors or, or fewer doctor visits necessarily, but there does seem like there's some effect of the law kind of like long-term on lower birth weights. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to square that with like, I would think the rise in stigma would be kind of when the law is being discussed maybe and not afterwards. Yes, uh, that's, that's a good point too. So we, you, you're right. So we did not find evidence of this more like um, physician, physician behaviors or like uh, prenatal care services. But, but I think, I mean, in terms of uh, if the mechanism is more about social climate, um, well, I mean, a ban was proposed and then it was actually enacted uh, a couple of years maybe after it was proposed. So the whole process is actually not sudden. So that's actually the tricky part of doing policy evaluations that um, the, the time, the year in which the, the ban was like enacted, that well, there were actually already maybe discussions about that. It, it's just that uh, um, we think the ban could uh, change something in the social climate and um, also consistent with a lot of the studies uh, conducted before when they examine other policies, it typically takes time for people to respond to, to this kind of policy. Um, so I think for things like earthquake or natural, uh, natural disaster, it makes more sense that at the time when the thing happened that people have this shock and then they receive the strongest effects there. But for like social policies, typically uh, we, we 
in other studies as well, we find the pattern to be gradually appear over time. Um, and then you talk about the population composition thing. I think that's actually a good point because um, now if I think about it, uh, so we actually don't know how many years a mother lives in this resident state. So it, it is possible that uh, the mother just moved to this state, so they haven't really uh, you know, experienced a lot of um, the, the anti-Asian sentiment in the states. Um, but that's something, uh, yeah, it's difficult to, to, to test, but I, I guess at least we can see whether we can find any statistics about what is the average uh, number of years Asian immigrants live in these resident states. Maybe we will be able to find something. Um, but I think the information of both resident state and the birth state can only tell us if, well, if say a mother lives in this conservative state and then she realized this anti-Asian sentiment, and then she decided to give birth to another state. So we can rule out that, but uh, yeah, I agree with you. We cannot rule out that how long the mother has actually lived in the resident states. We have about five. So how much oh, we oh, keep going? Okay, okay. so uh, thank, thank you so much. Um, you started your talk talking about um, general kind of anti-abortion um, sentiment and restrictions that have been occurring over the last you know decade, um, culminating in the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And I'm curious how, um, in your mind, when you're when you were kind of doing this work, how you kind of disentangled overall kind of abortion restrictions. Um, that are, you know, increasing at the state, like in many of the same states that are also enacting SSAPs and how, mm -hmm. um, you know, how if you, if you can kind of were thinking about how much of this could also be a function of, you know, overall anti-abortion restrictions. Um, and so one thing I was wondering is if you were able to look at states that are maybe more pro-choice pro or like more liberal states and whether mm -hmm. bans in those states had a different effect as maybe bans in states that are overall like very anti-abortion. Like I think a lot of the states that you had on that map that had SSABs enacted also have had a lot of other um, not sex specific um, bans as well and like increasing restrictions. So I'm just curious about how you thought about that. Too. Yeah, that's a very good question. So we did actually a lot of things to address this. <laughs> so the first thing we did is, um, we uh, actually only looked at, um, I, I think it's uh, Arkansas and uh, Arizona, the two states. So the two states only have sex right of abortion bans, but not the other anti-abortion policy. So we use these two states as treatment and this, the effects are still there. Mm -hmm. So the one thing we did, and the second thing, uh, again, we look at the effects of sex right of abortion bans on the other immigrant and non-immigrant groups. And if the a broader anti-abortion policy was the case, we would expect to see effects also maybe among uh, Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, or Hispanic immigrants as uh, this kind of marginalized groups. But we didn't see things there. So I think uh, the third thing is like our model specification, specification can take care of some of the, the concerns as well. So that's the things we, we did. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. I. Um... And this is still down an earlier question. Uh, I would think it would, uh, it would be surprising if there were uh, 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 stigma effects on Asian immigrants, but you didn't have echoes of the same effects on Asian Americans, maybe in lesser degree, but it would be surprising if you didn't have those in some degree. Uh, one potential explanation for seeing it among the Asian immigrants specifically, but not seeing something parallel among Asian Americans mm -hmm. would be that the states where this is going on are states with very few Asian, mm -hmm. you know, non-immigrant right. Asians. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, power is reduced for seeing what's happening among that subgroup in those states. Do you have anything to say about that possibility? It is possible, so we haven't really looked at the proportion of Asian Americans in those states. Uh, so we, we know there has been a rapid increase in Asian immigrants population. And I think, uh, again, I think the narrative uh, we see from the representatives is more about this foreign outsiders coming to our states, bringing the bad culture from their home country. Uh, so Asian Americans. Um, yeah, I mean, the yeah. Asian, you know, non-immigrant Asians report that as well. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Yeah, I agree that among Asian Americans, they also report that because people cannot tell whether they're immigrant or not. They just assume people are immigrant. Um, but um, 
Yeah, so uh, so I think uh, we, we could check the proportion of uh, Asian Americans. I think it's possible that Asian Americans, they don't like to live in those conservative states, but for some reason, Asian immigrants, they increasingly move to those states. Uh, but that's actually a very interesting possibility. Thank you. If I could, if I could add, because I, 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 I was very curious, there was a moment in your talk where you, you, you nicely described the hypothesis mm -hmm. that the interaction of the mothers with the expected mothers with the physicians mm -hmm. would lead them to be simply less likely to, to have abortions of any sort. That right. certainly is very plausible. Then you said that the data didn't support that. Right. I was curious to hear more. Yeah, yes. Um, right. So, so that one basically different state they have. Um, so we did a lot of legal work, uh, thanks for my students. <laughs> uh, they actually dig out the specific retire, uh, requirements attached to the sex select of abortion bans in each state. And some states, uh, I think uh, maybe Oklahoma or, or something, they, they just have this, oh, we don't allow abortion uh, based on the sex of the infant. That's it. There's no any specifics. And then where some states, I think maybe Arkansas, they have a lot of requirements. They have actually specific questions for physicians to ask if they suspect uh, the woman is getting abortion based on the, the sex of the infant. And also uh, there are lots of paperwork they need to fill. And also if they violate, violate the law, they face like jail time, they lose their license. So just a lot harsher and more explicit requirement towards physicians. Um, so we, yeah, so the rationale we want to test is that uh, for those states with a ban, with more strict or more explicit requirements for physicians, uh, if the mechanism is really going through the physician's behavior towards uh, and, and Asian mothers, right? So they have to ask a lot of like maybe potentially offensive questions or making the mothers uncomfortable. Uh, so that, that would increase the maternal stress or if the Asian mother is actually thinking abortion, so she may not want to seek an abortion anymore for various reasons and then carry out unhealthy babies. And these unhealthy babies tend to have lower birth weight and, and, and preterm birth. So that, that's the rationale there. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, thank you for this, this presentation. Um, I like a lot of the other questions. I think I'm sort of trying to probe the, get my head around the possible mechanisms. Um, and so one thing I was wondering about was, uh, you mentioned the immigrant policy index as sort of another measure of anti-immigrant <laughs> sentiment. And it wasn't it wasn't clear to me. It, I thought you'd said you you did sort of a you showed that that's predictive of the of the enactment of bans. But did you also do analysis where you include that as a predictor of the negative birth outcomes? And if so, like how does that compare to the effects of the of the bans? Um, and then the other thing I was wondering about is whether it seems like you have the possibility to get at some of this by using these states that were where the bans were either proposed or enacted, but but then blocked. And so that would be a way. I'm curious if you did sort of like direct comparisons of I forget it was like Indiana or uh, Kentucky, where like you know clearly the anti-immigrant sentiment is there, mm -hmm. but the policy was not actually implemented. And whether you, what sort of effects you find in that in those cases? Yeah, thank you for the questions. Oh, so we 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 use the the bands to predict the index, mm -hmm. and it significantly predicts the index. Um, so so we actually didn't do analysis using the index to, pre to predict birth outcomes, which I, we can. Uh, certainly do. Um, and then the second thing is about the three states that block the ban. Uh, so we, we did a lot of thinking. So first we include them in the analysis. So the results didn't change. And then eventually we, we decided to exclude them from the treatment group because uh, it's just like hard to, so we want to make the treatment group a little bit clean in a way that all the states actually have enacted the ban. So those three states, they passed the ban, it was enacted, but then it was shortly blocked by a judge. So it was not like effective eventually. So I, we think it's kind of uh, similar to those states which have proposed a plan but didn't actually enact it. And we, we chose the criteria of states actually enacting the ban because there's so many bans uh, being proposed every day in, in different states. So people may not take it seriously, but if the ban was enacted, so I think that it symbolically uh, means something. I mean, it sounded like if, if the results are the same for those states or if the results don't change with the inclusion of that states, that sounds like it's very strong evidence in, term, in favor of this sort of stigma, you know, sort of more like cultural environment mechanism. Um, but I would, I think that then you might want to consider including them or, or else discussing them specifically as a, as a case. Yeah, thank you. I just have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so from Zoom, we have a question, um, a related question about physician behavior. Mm -hmm. Does reaching out to physicians who share an Asian background themselves help in reducing stigma-related stress among Asian immigrants? And that's very much in the spirit of my question, which was, 
um, if we if we take your results as given, you know, what's the policy response? What's the intervention to try to reduce some of these um, impacts? Like, who are the actual agents here? Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm getting it a lot of folks thought like, is it physicians and providers who know about these laws um, that are really the most effective because they're the ones who might lose their license? Um, does the average person walking around in this town have any idea that this has mm -hmm. been passed? Um, how do you think about that? But I think that this question um, about reaching out to physicians really gets at a specific um, part of that. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, I, I think based on our findings, we we think it's very likely it's in this Asian immigrants' everyday lives. So it doesn't mean that everybody needs to know about the ban. So they just need to uh, sense the, the sentiment and behave in a more hostile way. And I, I think it's very unlikely it's because the physicians, first, we didn't find any evidence uh, of the physician behavior differences. And second, actually ask a lot of physicians, well, it's not the good evidence because no physician will say, oh, we actually, you know, <laughs> well, well, you perform this kind of ban. So I asked the physician, uh, OB in New York City, they said, oh, we, even if this ban was passed, we wouldn't do it. Uh, but that's just like one physician. Um, so um, in terms of policy responses, I really don't think it's the physician. I think uh, fundamentally, we should get rid of these sexological abortion bans and because there's no good reason to have them from the beginning and it makes things worse. And fundamentally, uh, the ban, of course, is just a manifestation of the anti-racial, um, anti anti-immigrant sentiment and um, how to change that. I think it's, it's very challenging, but at least we can start with removing these kind of bans. Thank you. I'm going to have us finish up now. We have another meeting at one starting, so we have a few minutes if you have a last question or if you just want to shake hands with our speaker. But thank you so much, Dr. Thank Dan. you. Thank you for this question.